The study of the slave narrative has long been associated with the study of bound books. Most of the narratives we read today, those of Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs or Solomon Northup, are fully-fledged autobiographies that run over a hundred pages and were originally published in book form. We teach them in heavily annotated, densely contextualised critical editions such as those published by Norton. Scholarship on the antebellum slave narrative has also tended to focus on separately published, book-length narratives. The titles are well known despite their formulaic character. Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. Incidents in the life of a slave girl. Twelve years a slave. As important as they are to American literary history, these texts give only a partial view of the genre we call the slave narrative, which includes a vast but neglected continent of shorter narratives originally printed in pamphlet form. Edmund Kelly, Leonard Black, Henry Watson, William Green, Lunsford Lane, Thomas Jones, G. W. Offley. These names might not sound familiar. Yet these men, like Douglas, all had their stories of enslavement and freedom committed to print. Unlike Douglas, they did not have ready access to the abolitionist infrastructures of print that emerged in the 1830s. Neither could they hope to participate in the largely white urban publishing industry. Instead, they turned to a local, informal economy of book publication and dissemination that involved job printers, newspaper editors and benevolent friends who provided pecuniary assistance. Their stories appeared as brief, sometimes roughly printed pamphlets that circulated at the margins of the literary marketplace. These narratives have received little critical attention, yet they are no less significant to the history of early African-American authorship and autobiography than the works of Douglas and Jacobs. Take the example of Edmund Kelly. Born enslaved in Tennessee, Kelly lived as a free man in New Bedford, Massachusetts by the end of the 1840s. When he was not preaching, Kelly spent most of his time raising funds to redeem his wife and children from slavery. After several years, he managed to purchase their freedom, contracting a heavy debt in the process. Print seemed to offer a way out of that debt. In 1851, Kelly published a 19-page pamphlet entitled A Family Redeemed from Bondage, being Reverend Edmund Kelly, the author, his wife and four children. The title page bore the inscription, published by the author, meaning that Kelly paid for the printing of the copies and sold them privately to friends, anti-slavery acquaintances and anyone willing to help a man in distress. In his introduction to the narrative, Kelly apologised for the humble aspect of the volume. To publish an expensive book, he wrote, would tend to involve me deeper in debt than I am at present. But an elaborate book was not what Kelly needed anyway. Pamphlets were much cheaper to manufacture. They could be carried around easily. People did not think twice before buying one, especially since Kelly did not set a fixed price. If any persons should desire copies of my pamphlet, he wrote to his brother, they may be obtained by addressing a line to me for whatever price they may please to give for them. At the same time that Kelly published A Family Redeemed from Bondage, Sojourner Truth wrote to her printer regarding her own 1850 narrative of Sojourner Truth, saying, don't get any more books bound. I can't sell the bound volumes. Portable, inexpensive and easier to self-distribute than a bound book, the pamphlet was a democratic format that empowered outsider authors, including African Americans, by giving them access to the world of print. Attention to lesser-known narratives published as pamphlets may usefully disrupt our notion of the slave narrative as a strictly codified genre with a clear political agenda. A Family Redeemed from Bondage looks nothing like the works of Kelly's more eminent counterparts. It contains little information about Kelly's early life, his experience of slavery, or his struggle for education and freedom. In lieu of a personal narrative, the reader is presented with a patchwork of letters, circulars and legal documents of all kinds. As one critic notes, Kelly lets the official record and correspondence of his life speak for itself. A family redeemed from bondage is not about originality or literary sophistication. For Kelly, textual production involved a series of reproductions that did not prevent him from claiming the status of author, as the title of his narrative parenthetically indicates. Nor can Kelly's text be described as politically militant. It certainly reveals, but does not comment on the greed of Kelly's family's enslaver, who extorted $2,800 from Kelly for the freedom of his loved ones. The narrative contains no anti-slavery diatribe, and it does not explicitly call for the abolition of slavery. It makes sense that book-length slave narratives should have eclipsed those that came out in pamphlet form. 
Books enjoy a higher degree of visibility than other types of print. They endure through time. Unless they are burned by an oppressive regime or pulped by a disappointed publisher, books usually survive censorship, critical failure, or, in the case of slave narratives, cultural repression. Although they were virtually ignored for a century, collecting dust on the shelves of libraries, copies of the narratives of Douglas and Jacobs remained intact. Pamphlets, on the other hand, are susceptible to destruction. In the words of a contributor to Frederick Douglass' paper, they are ephemeral caskets. Kelly's flimsy publication can hardly compete with Douglas's My Bondage and My Freedom, described by one of its contemporary reviewers as a very handsome volume of about 500 pages got up in the best style of the publishers and embellished with a very fine steel engraving of the author. In the shadow of Douglas's autobiographical masterpiece, a family redeemed from bondage is bound to look much more straightforward and on the whole less rewarding to study or teach. The recovery of early African-American print culture, however, would be incomplete without taking into account these shorter narratives. The pamphlet was not solely a vehicle for the black protest tradition embodied by activists and intellectuals such as Richard Allen, Maria Stewart, David Walker and Henry Highland Garnett. It also served the needs of many ordinary African Americans who, for a variety of reasons, hoped to turn their personal story into a printed text, yet lived in remote locales or did not benefit from the support of a black or white political organisation. Their narratives have long been available on electronic databases such as Documenting the American South. Because of their brevity and occasionally unsettling form, they may need to be approached differently than those of Douglas and Jacobs. Brian Sinch blends book history, biography and literary critical methods in his work on little-known figures such as Aaron and Major James Wilkerson, two formerly enslaved men who self-published short autobiographical narratives in the years preceding the Civil War. Taking as a starting point the 1843 narrative of the life of Moses Grandy, Christy Hyman has reconstructed the world of Moses Grandy using GIS and the artwork produced by her own daughter. The pamphlets published by Aaron, Wilkerson and Grandy may not look like much, yet between the yellowed paper wrappers lie lives carefully preserved by those who lived them and waiting to be creatively resurrected.